Good evening and thank you for joining me tonight just to talk to you about the external examinations and how you can support your son or daughter and also to go through some of the logistical things that we'll be facing and to talk about revision. So what I want to do tonight is I want to talk through the information we're getting from the UK at the minute regarding exams, to talk through how you know, the dates that are important and the process and the timeline over the next few months for the exams and also to talk through and look at how we uh, how we can prepare the students for exams so that they're as well prepared as possible. So first of all just some information we've received recently from the Department for Education. Now the Department for Education in the UK they oversee the exams that are run in England and international GCSEs and international A levels follow the, the processes and protocols pretty much of what's happening in the English exams. Scotland and Wales do think do it slightly differently, but international A levels and GCSEs they all follow what happens in England. And yeah, they've said here that exams across England will go ahead in summer 2021. Uh, they said this again at the start of December. And the UK government is saying, in their opinion, exams are the fairest and most accurate me way to measure attainment. And that's the information we're receiving, that's the information we're passing to the students. And it's also important information that you have so that you're aware that is at the minute the standpoint of the UK government. And therefore, that's what we have to expect to happen with the international GCC and A level qualifications. Now, Ofqual, who are the, the Office for Qualifications in the UK, they try and ensure some fairness of exams and they're working with the awarding organisations, so Edexcel and the exam boards, to, to provide details of additional support that provided in this, this year. And obviously they're, they're announcing that additional support at the end of January as soon as we have any information regarding that, we will pass it on to you. But that's so you're aware at the minute that's a process they're going through of saying, what can we do to support students to ensure you know, fairness as we go into this exam period? One of the things that Ofqual decided is that the grading will carry forward the overall grading weightings that we had in 2020. Now, there was a lot of issues with the 2020 exam results when they were first released to do with the gradings. And what they're saying is that the grade patterns that are you know, awarded to the students this year will be in line with the grade patterns that were awarded to students last year. Now, overall, those grade patterns were slightly more generous than been on previous years. And they're doing that to take into account sort of the disruption in the education of the students. They're also you know, have been saying that they will provide advance notice of some of the topic areas that will be covered in the exams. Now, at the minute, we don't have further details on that. We don't know to what level that will go, that will go but they're saying they'll provide some additional information. I would not be expecting it to be detailed, but it might just be a slightly you know, a more narrowing down than we get on the normal, the normal syllabus. Um, in some subjects, there'll be more supporting materials than normal, such as formula sheets will be provided in the exams. Now at A level, that's that fairly standard practice, so that won't be much of a difference, but it might mean that at GCSE, they provide some of the equations, for example, in GCSE physics, they may say, we're going to give you the equations. Now, obviously at the minute, we don't know the exact details of that. As and when we have more information, we'll, we'll obviously pass that on. Um, the Department for Education in the UK have said their priority is that there is a consistent approach um, and they acknowledge that due to the current situation, students have faced, some students have faced greater disruption than others and they're putting together an advisory group to try and look at how we can take, how they can take into consideration those issues because every school in the UK has had different issues with regards to how they've been impacted by COVID. For the international exam boards, every country in the world has a slightly different situation 
And so the international examples will be to try to look at that, think, how can we try and ensure this is as fair as possible? Now, in terms of where we are in the, the process with the exams, at the minute, Mrs Dawson, the exams officer, she's processing it, entries for the, the summer exams and generating the invoice. Now, just what will happen from this is statements of entry will be issued to, to students and parents. So parents will receive an email and students will receive an email. What is really important here is that those statements of entries are checked because that is where you and the student are looking at that saying they are the subjects I'm entering. Okay. If you come to us and say, you know, in April, March, and suddenly say, one of my subjects isn't on my statement of entry, I've not been entered, right? that will cause a problem, that it will incur late fees, and these are charged to us by the exam boards. And so you need to make sure that you check that statement carefully and you, you're making sure that all the subjects you expect to be sitting are on there. Yeah. If, you do, if you do notice anything missing, contact Mrs Dawson, the exams officer, get in touch with her immediately and say, look, I haven't got this subject, so she can make those changes. Obviously then invoices will be issued and payment and the exam fees needs to be done by the 10th of February. So they're the logistics side of ensuring the exams can run smoothly from parent and pupil side. In terms of the, you know, the dates, uh, the IGCCs will run, they're saying at the minute, they will run from the 4th of May to the 17th of June. Um, we don't, you know, the exact, exact timetable is being released and students will then be able to see when their exams are. The A-levels, international A-levels start slightly earlier, but finish on the same date. So again, yeah, come the new year, we'll be starting to issue a full timetable to the students. These are the, when the exams happen, and this is the dates that you need to be aware of. I know in the UK, they've been doing a lot of work with the exam boards, talking about what would happen if a student misses, has to miss one exam because they test positive for COVID and aren't allowed to sit the exam. So they are putting contingencies in place for that. In a lot of subjects, they sit more than one paper. So if the student you know, has medical certificates to say they had to miss that exam for various reasons, they're, they're looking at ways to try and solve that problem. Now, the first thing on the students' minds at the minute will be the mock exams. So for the year 11s, they're going to be the week commencing the 9th of January. And for the year 12s and 13s, they're going to be the week commencing the 14th of February. Now these, the mocks, they're a chance for the students to practice, and especially for the year 11s, to have that experience of being in the exam room and sitting in an exam with all of your peers and that nervousness that comes with having to go into that room and do the exams. So it's important the students take this seriously. It is, you know, the year 12s and 13s will know very well through the experience from last year that the mocks played a part in the grades we had to submit to the exam board. We are desperately hoping that isn't the situation we'll be in. As I said earlier, the UK government is saying exams are going ahead, but it is, you know, definitely in the student's best interest to make sure they're doing these mocks as well as they possibly can. So that one, it gives them confidence and two, it shows their teachers what they're capable of. And you know, they need to, the more seriously they take them, the more they will get out of them as an experience. Okay? So once the mocks are done, we will, you know, we will issue mock results. We've normally had the students in and we publish a, a result sheet for them. So they don't get their results individually like you do if you just did a series of tests in class. You get one day, at the end of the day, you'd come to the auditorium and you get given a sheet with, they would be the grades you had got on. And again, that is part of the exam experience that they'll go through in the summer. That horrible feeling of waiting for your results and the joy of seeing that you've done well or the disappointment of seeing you didn't do as well as you had or would have liked. And so, it's important that the students face those and can learn from them and either take confidence or address areas where they realise it's clear I need some support here and this, this subject area or this unit 
is a problem. Now, the most important message that we need to be giving to the students is they are going to have to sit exams. I know that in the back of their mind, some of them are thinking, oh, they'll be cancelled again. That is a dangerous mindset to get into. If the students start thinking the exams will be cancelled, that, that means they'll slacken off in their preparations potentially, and they won't therefore be prepared as and when they have to sit them. So everything we do needs to be geared to them doing exams in the summer and being as well prepared as they can be. And yeah, this is, this is a message a year ago. I never thought in my lifetime I'd have to say to be saying we need to be telling the students they are going to have exams. But obviously with the events of the last 12 months, everything is slightly uncertain, but this is important that they realise that every message we're getting is that the exams are going ahead and the students need to be prepared for those. Um, and not preparing for them puts them in a bad situation if the exams happen. And in the remote chance that they don't happen, it again is detrimental to them because they haven't shown us the level of work that they need to to give us the, uh, the evidence to award them the best grades they can. So it's important that you and them in discussions, if they're saying, the students are saying to you, oh, I don't think that the exams will probably be cancelled. As far as we're concerned, as far as the UK government, the exam board are concerned, the exams are going ahead. And that has to be how we prepare you know, for them moving forward. In terms of revision, it is, it's important to sit down with the students and the students to sit down and look at their revision and work out what they're going to do. And there are several stages to this. For the, for the real exams, you need to be taking time over this and you need to plan your revision. The students need to plan their revision and you need to sit with them and think, how are we going to plan this revision? What are you going to do and when are you going to do it? And that involves things like a study space and a revision plan. And I'll look at those in a bit more detail. They then need to move on to consolidating their knowledge and understanding. So you know, doing what we would call good old fashioned revision. Do they know the stuff they're meant to know? Okay. I'd then recommend looking at lots of, sort of low stakes recall practice. You know, flashcards, pop quizzes. They should be checking the syllabus. And again, you can do that with them, looking at the syllabus and saying, do you know, you know which bits of this do you understand, which bits don't, which are your causes for concern? And talking to the teachers and making, the making sure the teachers have put the syllabuses on teams so that the students know exactly what they have to do. Again, once you've done all those processes, there should be some more consolidation. I've revised, I've done some flashcards. Let's go back, let's revise again, let's look at what I didn't know. And then also the final part of the revision process really is the application of the past paper questions. So although that is part of it, in my opinion, that should not be the first part of your revision. Uh, the, that practice in the application, that's something that should come later. So what I'm going to do for the next 10 minutes or so is just talk through some of the revision strategies and how you should be going about these things to make sure that your son daughter is in the best place and you're in the best place to support them so you can know what messages we've been giving them and talk about their revision. As I said at the bottom, revision is not sitting reading a textbook for two hours. Okay? That's, you know, that is pretending to revise. Okay? So what's important here when we're looking at revision and looking at your son or daughter's work is it is not about how many hours they've done. It's about the quality of the work that they've produced. Okay? If they've if you say to your son and daughter, what have you done? What revision have you done? And they say physics or chemistry. What? All right. What have you done? It should not be. I've sat here and read the book. Okay? Their revision should be active. They should be producing things. They should be answering questions. It, should be, right? it shouldn't be OK, because if they're sitting reading the book, they're probably not taking it in. And it's someone else's work. They're not engaging with it. They're just skimming through chapters. So while they might while they might be using a book, to, the textbook or their notes to consolidate and to, as part of the process, that shouldn't be what they class as that's been my revision for the day. 
So the first thing that they'll need, that they'll need and they'll need your help with as parents is to create a study space. So they need a clean and tidy desk that they can work at. Now, my son is only 11 and I, he, I know the challenge of keeping your children to have a tidy, air, tidy work area and a tidy room. With teenagers, I can only imagine how challenging that is. But if they're to have a you know, effective study, they need somewhere to work. They need a chair that is at a proper height and they need a, a desk and such so they can work properly. One of the habits I got into was just when I was in probably year 11 is I would come home and I would work on the coffee table at home. And as a result of that, I ended up needing to go and see a physiotherapist because I had problems with my back. And I was 16 and quite sporty and I put my back out because I was working in a bad position and I was hunched forward and spending you know, a significant time doing that. So please make sure you sort them out with a, a good workspace, a desk with a chair at the right height that allows them to work. That study space, that should be away from their distractions. You know, they cannot be really be studying with the TV on. Games console shouldn't be there. It should be you know, a work focused room, not play focused room. When they're revising, I would be encouraging them to leave the phone in the living room as much as possible. Okay? It will tempt them away from their studies. If their phone is there, they will look at it. And you know, if, it's, if it's away from them, they're less tempted to look at it. They've got to get up and make an effort and come through and you know, be visible to you to be saying, I've come away from my work to check you know, my social media. And so I'd recommend keeping the phone away from, from, from them while studying and students. That's in your best interest. You know how tempting the phone is. All right. While needing a study space important, one of the greatest enemies of of preparing for exams is procrastination and some students will spend two weeks organizing their room you know, if we're not on them and telling them right it's done now get going they'll keep rearranging it keep moving things around and they will you know, be pretending that they're getting ready to study but really they're just doing anything to put that off so it needs to be a job that's done once and really when they come back in january to school they should have their study space sorted and then that needs to stay as their study space as they go through and prep. What, what we also would like to do um, is make sure they have a balance between subjects in their revision okay, and, and also to look at you know, how long they spend on each subject. Okay? So they should have an even balance between subjects and they should be realistic. It's easy for students to, folk, to make revision plans where they say they're going to do nine hours a day and they're just not. So they need to make sure that that's something that is being done and being done sensibly. Um, also, they should only really be spending 30 to 40 minutes on a, in a block of revision, then have a little break, then come back and do 30 to 40 minutes of something else. If if they're sitting down trying to do two or three hour stints at a time, they're not going to be productive. So, you know, short 30, 40 minute session, five, 10 minute break, another 30 to 40 minute session. Yeah. Routines are an important part of this. And as parents, you can definitely help with this. 
So having set meal times and eating together as a family helps the students because they can then plan their work and they can know at that time, that's when I'm going to eat so I can build my revision plan around that. And you're not in a position where they've just started doing some work. They then have to come through for dinner. They need to know that's when dinner will be and they can plan their revision around that. Having set bedtimes is also important. Working really late in the night is not effective and it just makes them less productive the next day. Healthy breakfast. Yeah, it is a really important part of the student's day, especially in the exam period, but also in the build up to it to make sure that they're you know, eating well, looking after themselves and also rewards. They will need that breaks and downtime from their revision and things to look forward to. Right? Whether that's watching a film, meeting friends, playing sport, they need to continue doing those sorts of things. Often I hear you know, that people have given up everything they enjoy doing because they've got exams coming up. Now, I, I don't think that's the right way to go about it. Yes, you maybe will scale back slightly, but you still need the students still need to have those outlets to allow them downtime so that when they come to, to their work, they feel refreshed and able to cope with it. Yeah? If it is non-stop revision, then they will they will start to lose motivation and they need that that outlet. Now, as part of the revision strategies, now cre creating knowledge organizers. Now, a long time ago, these were called revision sheets, but it's a summary of what they need to know for, for various topics. Now, most of your subjects will be broken down into sections, into units of work, whether that's on a certain period in history or it's on certain aspects of science or the different novels that you might have studied in English. Now, you want to be creating a knowledge organiser for each of those, and this should really be the, one of the first bits of, your revi of the revision that the students do. So when they say they're revising physics, to start with, they sh that should be creating a summary of everything they need to know for that unit. So if they're revising you know, waves in physics, they should come out with either a page in OneNote or a piece of A4 paper that that is their summary of that topic and the idea is that all the key vocabulary the explanations the diagrams images acronyms mnemonics all those are on that piece of paper so they no longer need to go into their exercise book and their textbook because they've condensed the key information onto that that sheet now they then need to create these obviously for all their subjects now i would be saying that during the mocks Beginning to make these is really good prep for the box because it, make, it helps with their understanding. And once you've made them, you've got them to move forward and take through to the summer. And these are also really useful because if you, if you do them in OneNote or an A4 paper, you can print them out or you can la copy them, you can make, you can laminate them, and then you can put them in various places and so that there's, they're always to hand. It mentions there you know, the format and the layout and colours. It's, you know, it's important, I think, to try and use colour in these knowledge organisers because that helps with your memory. And so if you've got little different sections within the knowledge organiser you've made, having those as different colours helps jog your memory. In the exam, you can think, oh, it was on my sheet that I had about such and such a topic. It was in green. It was at the top left, it was next to this, all right, yeah. And then you can, it helps you retrieve it. Okay? Using colour does not mean writing every word in a different colour so it just looks you know, a glaring sort of mess. It means you know, putting different sections in different colours to help differentiate in your mind the different sections of knowledge that, with, that you've got on there. Okay? But again, having it neat and organised helps with trying to, trying to memorise it. Right. Now, once you've got your knowledge organised, it's, it's then about doing the low stakes recall. And as parents, this is where you can do a lot of support. So flashcards and pop quizzes, testing knowledge of definitions, key facts, quotes. You know. So before they're doing the long sort of difficult answer questions and the writing essays and solving complex problems, 
Do they know the key facts? Do they know the definitions? And as parents, you can get you or siblings involved in this and be rigorous with them. If they've written the definition down, when they repeat it, they should get that right. It shouldn't be somewhere near. It should be that's the definition. Now, one way to do this is to make it part of the daily routine. A lot of, you know, I often talk to parents, parents eating about this, about saying, you know, before they get their dinner, they've got to answer 10 questions. So you've got the flashcards, you've said you've been revising this, right, you were revising organic chemistry for GCSE, right, we've got your organic chemistry flashcards, here's 10 questions, let's see how you get on. Okay, and that, that keeps, that routine of just, that lets you know, are, are they able to recall it? which lets you know if they've been doing the work as the parent. And for the student, it helps them because it, it puts them on the spot and makes them have to know it. Yeah. Also with the knowledge organisers, some students I've worked with, they've had laminated copies of the knowledge organisers and they've become the placemats at dinner. And so again, over, over dinner, yeah, the student can just get asked a couple of questions from the placemat that the other people at the table have and checking their their understanding and helping them try and have that recall. In terms of flashcards, there are loads of websites that allow you to make flashcards. I simply Googled 10 best or best websites for making flashcards. Virtually all of these offer apps for Android and iPhone so that you can not only type the flashcards, type the flashcards into the computer, it produces them for you and gives you electronic copies of them. I've not used all of these before. I have used Study Blue quite a lot in the past with my groups, and it does work very well. And they have features on them where you can have the same deck. It tells you how you've been doing with that deck of flashcards, because you have to say if you got it right or wrong. It can then allow you can then choose to just study the ones you've consistently got wrong, so that you you're focusing on the areas that you need. But also producing the flashcards, that's an important part of the region because that helps you think about what information do I need to know. And so yeah, you should be encouraging your, your son or daughter to try and make flashcards for their subjects. It makes it easy for you to test them and it's a really useful way to help for them to revise. Now the syllabus is yeah. a summary that we get as teachers that tells them exactly what they need to know. And these are available to students. Are we Get, trying to get the teachers to make sure they've shared, shared them with the students on Teams. And this is a good way to, to go through and think, where are the areas that I feel confident? Where are they not? Yeah. An exercise I've often done with groups as, as an in-class revision is to go through the syllabus with three different colour highlighters, highlighting green, the bits you're confident with, red, the bits that you think you don't know at all, and orange, the bits you're not sure of. And that allows the students to think, where am I? and which bits do I need to focus on and which bits am I feeling more confident on. Now past papers I spoke about earlier, I'm, and I'm saying students shouldn't be going straight into past papers in my opinion, they're an essential part of the revision but it, it should not be the first part of the revision. Okay. For me, it, you have to do them, you have to practice this because it's what you're going to have to do in the exam, but you don't want to be just constantly doing past papers forever. You need to try and learn the material first, check that you've got the recall. So don't start, don't you know, get them doing past papers too early, you know, but, and when they're first doing past papers, they should be doing them with their knowledge organisers. So with the knowledge, information I have on my knowledge organiser, can I complete this paper? Okay. Now, to start with, the past papers will take them quite a long time to do potentially, but that's practice of can I answer the questions? Can I do this? As you get nearer and nearer the exam time, that's when they want to be starting to get, the students need to be starting to do the exam, do the past papers in the time allowed without any notes. So what they need to become is less and less dependent on the notes and faster and faster at completing the paper. But there is, you don't need, they don't need to start straight away with, I'm going to do this all now, I'm going to give myself an hour and a half. The other thing that's important for students to do when they're looking at past papers 
and for you to have a conversation with them about is why are they doing the past paper? So sometimes they will do it because they want to develop their knowledge and use it to see what they're going to be asked, get their notes out, make sure they get what you might call perfect answers. So they're going to really take their time over it to say, can I get the model answers down? Now, when you're doing that, yes, you need the students and need to look at it against the mark scheme and using the mark schemes is really important for them. But we, you're, they're not doing that to, to get a mark on the paper because they're using everything they've got to try and just make sure they do it as well as they can. Sometimes they will do it, they need to do a past paper where they say, I'm now going to do this one and try and do it as an exam without any notes in the time I'm given to see where I am. And so there are different reasons for doing a past paper. And if they say to you that the students say to you, I'm doing a past paper, yeah. have that discussion with them. Well, how are you doing it? Is it a past paper you're doing where you're going to use your notes and try and do it, get everything right? Or are you doing it as a, a test for yourself to see how you would do if you had to sit the exam? Because those, yeah. they are different sort of ways to go about it. And you need to therefore treat the paper differently because there's no point spending all the time doing the paper, using all your notes and then marking it and going, oh, I did really well. I'm in a really good position here. Because if you can't do that in the time, you're, you're giving your, the students are giving themselves false, false hope. Now, I've said here other helpful hints to use colour in the notes. So if they're saying they're making revision notes, talk about using colour. It does help them remember. Now, as a family, have revision sheets around the house, right? Their bathroom mirror, the bedside table, you know, the back of the toilet door. You know, if they sit in the front passenger seat of the car, have some revision sheets stuck on that dashboard so that it's there and they can see them. And even though they're not actively revising as they're driving into school, that information is there in front of them. And it's that, that constant reinforcement of those of that information that they need. So all of those things just help you know, to just keep that information coming in. If they have revision notes on their bathroom mirror that they see every day for six, for four months, some of that, that information will go in whether they want it to or not. OK. Also, you need to encourage the students to ask for help. They should be asking their classmates for help as well as the teachers. Right? The students here are all going through the same thing. They're all going through their exams. They need to be working together. They need to be helping each other. Now, helping each other is different from copying off each other. Now, so two people working together to solve a paper and sharing ideas, that is great. That's, that's how they get better. With one question, somebody saying, oh, if we can do it this way. And on the next question, someone else might be chipping in with the way of doing it. That's great. What you need to, to know and trust with your son or daughter is when they have, you know, if they're having a study group with a friend, if they're you know, doing that online, you know, are they make, make, just make sure they're using that time productively and they've set you know, time limits, a, a time bonded activities for what they're going to do. They might say so and so is going to come around and study. We're going to study maths together and they might say we're going to study maths from half six and we're going to do two sessions half six to 10 past seven, and then 10 minute break, 7.20 till eight o'clock. But, but at eight o'clock, we're gonna stop, and then we're gonna just have a relax and a catch up. And as long as they work hard in that time, then that works well. You just need to make sure that you know, they use the study, when they have a study partner, or if they're doing study in a group, that they are actually studying and it isn't just a, a, a chat. Another thing that can help with students is songs and rhymes and help with memory. So anything like that that can help, you know, is going to help them with, with their exams. Okay, and help them keep that information in. Now, in terms of you know, parents, what you can do to help as well. These are things the students need to be doing that you need to be on with and supporting. But engage with them about their revision. Right? I, I know what you will get back from teenagers. How's school going? Fine. How's your revision? Yeah, good. What you're revising? Maths. What sort of maths? 
just maths, right? So you're going to have to probe them to get information. You're going to have to know what they're doing, what's, what they're going through. So you'll need to be able to, have to say to them, well, let's have a look at the syllabus. Which bit of the syllabus were you doing? Right, what bits of that were you finding difficult? And you need that information as much as them so that you can have an informed conversation with them. I spoke about routines in the house. That's an important part of it. And it solves arguments. If you know when they're revising, you, they know when meals are, they know what their chores are if, they do, if they've got chores to do around the house, they know, you know when their downtime is, it stops conflict, it stops argument. If there's a clear rule on you know, where the phone is when revision's going on, it doesn't need to be a constant argument. So, and over the next you know, six months, there will be opportunity for argument because students will be stressed, parents, you'll be stressed. So we need to try and make sure we minimize you know, the points where conflict can, can occur. You can help them by ensuring they have a space to work. Now, they still need to make sure they keep that space tidy and you probably will have to remind them of that but making sure they've got a decent space to work will be a big help test them on their knowledge you know get get involved with the flashcards and the revision grids with them and the knowledge organizers checking that they understand it uh, they will try you know, they will try to palm you off but make sure you get involved um, in your discussions with them I spend a lot of time talking to students about concentrating on the process, not on the outcome. OK, students, students can easily get focused on their exam results. Now, worrying about exam results doesn't help exam results. Students and parents need to worry about the process of pre preparation for the exam. So, OK, you're worrying about maths. What can we do to prepare? What more do we need to do? Which bits are you worried about? OK is a much more helpful conversation than why, what grade do you think you're going to get? Because what the conversation needs to be about is how can we make sure you do as well as you can? Okay? We also, it's important that students realize that their exam results aren't a measurement, aren't a judgment on their self-worth. Every student in our school will get different exam results and have you know, different grades constitute success for them. Okay, so, What's important for you with, this, with the students is you talk to them about their preparation. You know, they need to know that as long as they can show you that they've prepared properly and they've put the effort in and they've, tried, they've achieved as well as they can and prepared as well as they can, then you will be supportive of them and the grades they get are then the grades they get. It's, if they do the preparation pro properly, you know, then they've done all that they can. And we need to make sure our focus of conversations is about preparing for the exam, not about the results. Okay. And my final point is we need to, as parents, you need to monitor their mental state and their stress levels. You know your son or daughter, you know, you, know, you can tell when they're feeling the pressure, you can tell when you think that they're you know, not doing enough. And if you feel that the students are getting, you know, really stressed, take time out, talk to them about it, find out what in particular it is that's causing them stress. And you know, keep being aware that they are going to go through ups and downs, periods where they feel that they're on top of it, periods where they're really worried about it. And we need to do all we can to minimise that stress, but the exams, you know, they, they matter to the students and they want to do well. And they are going to get nervous about them at times. So please do keep monitoring that and you know, try and work out as a parent, when's the time to, to push them and to be saying, right, come on, I don't, you, you don't seem to have done much this week. Your schedule said this many, you're going to do this, this and this, and you missed yes, two sessions yesterday. You've missed you know, a couple of the day before. You know, are you getting behind here? What's causing that? Make sure you get on with it. And sometimes it'll be time to say, you just need to take 10 minutes, let's sit and watch, or half an hour, let's just sit and watch a film, let's decompress, let's just step away from the books and give yourself some headspace because they will need that as well. And it's a fine line to try and judge, but you will know, you obviously know your child and you need to work out you know, when each of those approaches is, is required. Now, obviously, 
as we get closer to the exams, we'll be talking more and more to the students about all the things we've talked about here. We'll also be probably talking to you again as parents about you know, preparation and how the exams are going to work and the logistics of it. If your student, you know, if, if you or your son or daughter have got questions about the exams, please get in touch either with Miss Allen or Miss Standard or Miss Standard or Miss Leg. You know, they will be able, or Miss Dawson, they'll be able to answer your questions in the first instance. But you know, preparation is key. I, what I'll do is I'll make sure this this presentation gets put on Teams so that all the students have have got it, and therefore you'll be able to have access to it. And obviously this presentation will be on the, on the website, so you'll be able to watch it back and look through the slides if there's things that you've, you want to look back over. OK, so I hope that's been helpful to you and thank you very much for your, for your time this evening. And I hope that you and the students plan to have a rest over the, the winter break. I know the year 11s will be prepping for their mocks. We've been trying to do some consolidation with them over this week and just to get, get them into thinking about what they've got coming up. But it is important that as well as doing some work that they have some downtime to, to try and get themselves in the right frame of mind for what's going to be a tough term ahead when we come back in January. So thank you very much for your time. And as I said, this recording will be available on the website in a day or two. Okay, thank you.